And now we continue uh, with an, again with an experimentalist. Although she works in a theory group, uh, I was told uh, the theorists would not accept uh, that I would call her a theorist, so she's an experimentalist in accelerator physics. And uh, she will tell us how to accelerate things with uh, not these big tunnels, but maybe more on a tabletop-like uh, way. And therefore, I'd like to welcome Judita Beinor Taite, who will talk about plasma accelerators. Yeah. Judita, please. Um, hello, yeah, I think the sound works well. So, I am Edita, and I am a part of a fresh new batch of physicists from 2020, um, who entered the field of academia with a pair of comfy slippers, some cozy pajamas, and a Zoom account. <laughs> oh, sorry, I just muted myself. I'm too used to Zoom. Today, I will tell you about particle accelerators and um, plasmas. So, I really love science, and I chose to do science because I was often bothered by these existential questions like, why does our universe exist? Um, what was its beginning, the Big Bang like? Are there extra dimensions? Is there dark matter? Uh, is there an underly underlying th uh, like theory of everything? Or will we discover something totally new? Or even, can our discoveries be made within the capacity of available civil engineering technology while remaining environmentally, economically, and socially sustainable, and within the limited taxpayers' budget dedicated to the high energy physics sector? <laughs> A lot of puzzling questions, very existential. And I might not be able to answer them today, but a tool that can help us is Particle Accelerator. It's a machine that accelerates particles with an elect electromagnetic field. So the particles can be, you know, electrons, anti-electrons, also protons or ions. And, you know, you, you might not be bothered by these physics questions, and that's fine. That's a matter of taste. Um, but that doesn't mean that particle accelerators shouldn't be important to you. And that's because places where particle accelerators are used for high energy physics, only a small fraction of where they're used in the world. Actually, almost half of particle accelerators are used in radiotherapy, cancer research. So they are truly the tool of our era. Currently, however, our accelerators are getting very big. So let's go back to the existential question, which we can shorten to be, can we make our accelerators smaller, cheaper, more sustainable? Currently, accelerators are made of many parts, like magnets, beam diagnostics, bigger magnets, and maybe sometimes people inside of them. But the acceleration happens in the accelerating cavities. Accelerating cavities sustain electrical field, the accelerating field, which we measure in megavolts per meter. And the higher the field, the higher the energy the particle gains in this cavity. And the more cavities you have in a row, the more energy the particle will gain as it goes through all these cavities. Currently, we're facing a bit of a problem where we're reaching the highest possible energies we can achieve in our current accelerators. And um, it's mostly because we can't go to higher fields in our cavities, because if you go too far, you'll start getting this, electrical discharge. Um, so what can we do to achieve these super high energies, the ones that we need to you know, look for Higgs and other particle physics questions need to be answered? Um, maybe we could just take whatever cavities we have, the ones that can sustain the highest possible fields, and add a lot of them in a row. That is possible but then you end up with 50 kilometer projects, like Geneva for scale, if not anything bigger. Um, and that kind of contradicts my question. Can we make our accelerator smaller, cheaper, and so on? Uh, it seems like we should be really working on these cavities. I work in the field that things that we should just keep going, you know, just crank it up, and just keep going a little bit more. Yeah, settle for that, like gigavolts per meter work with plasma. You know, the fourth state of matter, beyond gas, where atoms and molecules are separated into ions and electrons. Um, oh, sorry, I keep forgetting. You can find it on the 
I forget about it because I'm an accelerator scientist, so I don't see a lot of it. Sunlight, you can find it on the sun. Um, and then you get accelerators such as these, little tiny accelerators filled with plasma that are just a few centimeters long, but for scale. Uh, so theoretically, if you have plasma accelerator that's one kilometer long, you could achieve one tera electron volt in that length. Um, that's the sort of energy that the 50 kilometer project is aiming to achieve. So that's quite promising. So, you know, you would take these high precision machines made with pristine vacuum, pristine equipment, and we're going to replace them with this temperamental complicated plasma? You know, that might sound hopeless to you. And if it does, you're wrong, because there's more hopeless things out there. For example, my attempt to be a footballer at university. On the left, you see a video of me playing a match at my university. I receive the ball, I don't know what to do with it, so I just pass it, and the opposing team receives it. Yeah, football is easy. But just because I suck at football doesn't mean the football can't be played well. Equally, we can actually accelerate electrons, or most electrons, in our plasma accelerators. The way we do it is that we have two bunches. The first one, the driver one, uh, can be also a laser pulse or a proton bunch, but here we use electron bunches. It enters the plasma and it creates a wake field, this accelerating environment. And after the driver comes the witness bunch. Here we only use electrons for now, and it gets accelerated. I think this process is well described by this proper football game that you're going to see on the right. You will see a player receive a ball. He will be dribbling around the defenders and creating this goal-scoring opportunity. He will assist the, uh, his teammate, who will then score the goal. So he's like the driver, and his teammate's like the witness getting accelerated and scoring the goal. So he receives the ball, dribbles around the player, creates the weight field, and then field acts on witness, and goal. Witness is accelerated. Um, so this is how it works. But you know, just because I did well on my team trial days doesn't mean I'll do well in the entirety year of my football at university, and that was the case for me. Equally, just because you accelerate electrons well doesn't mean anything. You need to accelerate them many times. And a good example of that is the Higgs discovery. So in 2012, when CERN announced the Higgs boson discovery, the Large Hadron Collider was operating at 100 million collisions per second. And it took them one year to announce the discovery since the start of data taking, approximately. So if we were to use plasma accelerators, which currently operate at one hertz, so one repetition, one collision per second, we would need 100 million years to discover Higgs. So we should have started a little earlier. <laughs> um, there is a bit of a catch. In Large Hadron Collider, we use protons, which are not fundamental particles. They're made, they're made of gluons and quarks. Uh, in plasma accelerators, we would be using electrons and anti-electrons, which are fundamental particles. So when two protons meet, it's like a crowd of people talking to each other, so lots of noise. When an electron and anti-electron meet, it's like uh, two people meeting, so it's, you can make out that conversation. So you need less collision per second to discover Higgs at a conventional collider. However, with plasma accelerators, you would still need 10,000 years. So um, I think that still proves the point that we should have high repetition rates. The issue in plasma is that it is a complicated, complex, dynamic system with lots of ions and electrons moving around and interchanging energy, um, colliding and so on. And then you have this bunch just going through, creating a wake field, drawing ions towards the, and from the axis, electrons the same. And we don't know what happens in the time where the second bunch should arrive. And we don't know how many times we can repeat this acceleration and how, how soon. Actually, I think I know who knows that. And that's the experiment I work with. A real plasma accelerator. Welcome to Flash Forward. Flash Forward is an American television series based on a novel written... Um, sorry, I'm just completely confusing two things. That's Flash Forward. It's a plasma accelerator research facility at DAISY. We receive electrons from Flash 
from the linear accelerator, which arrive at our plasma chamber, which is hooked up with these high voltage cables and gas pipes. And inside there, there's our plasma accelerator, where the electrons get accelerated. So in order to understand how quickly we can repeat a second acceleration, we put a second bunch after this first one. So here in the diagram, you can see the first one in front, second one in the back. And we found that it actually takes six to three nanoseconds for the plasma to recover before we can accelerate again. So if we were able to construct an accelerator with many of such bunches separated at six to three nanoseconds, it would give us a repetition rate of 10 million per second. And that's great, because I think that would give us a Higgs discovery with an electron-anti-electron collider in way less than one year. I think that would be eight hours, which is, which is great news, you know, because for once, PhD students could ho go home before 5 p.m. Yeah. So plasma accelerators are there at the beginning, but they are very promising. And before we can build colliders with them and so on, we have to overcome a lot of challenges. But hopefully, once we do, we can continue on and answer more of these questions. And that's kind of inspiring, you know, because we as humans, scientists, we approach these limits of like energies and um, accelerators and plasmas, but they don't limit us. We sit down and we work on them. And that opens itself a wealth of depth and depth of new questions and lines of exploration that allows us to never cease to discover new things and reveals the dizzying heights of possibilities in research. Or maybe we just think of something quirky, replace high precision machines with plasmas, and realize that quirky ideas can sometimes turn out to something pretty serious. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chiquita. Thank you.